proudly sponsored by you. We couldn't do what we do each week without your help. So if you'd like to show your support for Pixel Sift, you can do so right now by heading to our merch store. So that's pixelsift.com.au forward slash store. You can pick up some t-shirts. We've got a couple of different designs there. A tote bag or some extremely yellow socks that I can see Scott wearing right now. He is close to his body at all times. <laughs> Very excited to wear those. Uh, and if you head to the store, you can get a 25% off uh, if you enter the code SIFTERS. So that's pixelsift.com.au forward slash store with the promo code SIFTERS. Hello and welcome to episode 96 of <coughs> Pixel Sift. Now, it's the first time you tuned in. We're a weekly video gaming show and we talk to game creators from around the world and we ask them why they create the things they do. My name is Gianni and joining me are my co hosts, Scott. Hello. And Sarah. <coughs> Hello. <laughs> this week, we, our guest is Ian McClarty. He's the creator of Dissembler and a stack of other games. Ian, thank you very much for joining us this week. Ian, you there? You. Hey, Ian. Thanks for joining us this week. And Scott Rawls, we're going to be checking out another topic that's been sort of making the waves on- online. Yes. Uh, our topic today, will be having a glance at the world of mobile games once again, specifically the highly successful yet criticized Harry Potter Hogwarts mystery. A lot, of, lot to discuss there. Let's jump in, shall we? Yep. So, recently, there's been a lot of press coverage for the mobile game Harry Potter Hogwarts Mystery. While if we looked at the statistics of the game's performance, it would seem a highly successful romp from Harry Potter into the gaming mobile gaming scene, uh, gaming critics seem to be tearing the game and its associates apart. But who is really to blame here? Now, Destructoid, if you would listen to them, uh, they an article written by CJ Andreessen, uh, said that this story, though the, through the first year at least, is not engaging in the slightest. I could sit here and do a thing that game bloggers pretend to be journalists, pad out an article by breaking down the visuals and music <laughs> and whatnot. But none of that matters when the game is this goddamn bad. Uh, and it says that the Hogwarts Mystery thinks it can try to squeeze money out of players by putting time restrictions on everything. Now, that being said... I think it's very important to note that that is a heavily opinionated piece. Yes. And comes <laughs> from one outlet. Yes, absolutely. And Extremely it was bit, opinionated. Yeah. And it was a bit of a standout as far as that goes. Um, there's a lot more going on as far as coverage of the game out there. Interestingly enough, I think... Uh, so, an article in Game of Sutra written by Vadim Bulatov actually said for the first week after it was released, it was firmly established in the top of the App Store ratings by April 30. Uh, so this is it was released on the 24th and by April 30th it entered the list of games earning more than a million dollars a day. At that point, there are only 10 da- games on the list other than Harry Potter. <laughs> and it seems to me that the success can be explained by examining the influence of five-factor gameplay, monetization, development, team, franchise, and trends. So what do we think about this? It's uh, an interesting sort of trend that we've seen a move away from these timer-based uh, microtransaction and gameplay for mobile games. It seems to be sort of an old-fashioned uh, way of, of having it now in in the long history of mobile gaming. It's not, it's not massively long, but we've kind of moved away from that. Yeah, absolutely. That was definitely that first-generation uh, mobile games. They'll very much uh, wait five hours or pay $2. Yes. Um, but, yeah, we have definitely moved away from that. I think the caliber of mobile gaming, as much as it is not my thing, mm. has become better, especially with the recent um, adding or of... Um, PUBG yes. and the other one. Fortnite. <laughs> um, the other one. Yeah. Um, apparently, they've been quite good on mobile. I still am yet to play, although I have installed them. Uh, but you yourself have mm. um, praised them highly, which is very surprising. And they uh, also, yeah, they have sort of moved in that direction in the way that microtransactions have, have moved across the industry in general. In that yeah, they and loot boxes towards in console and all the other games. Away from the sort of advantage giving loot boxes that are sort of requiring you to do it or yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, towards the more cosmetic and, and sort, sort of thing. Now, Ian, you've just uh, made a game, uh, Dissembler, which is out on the mobile platforms. And I'm just wondering, what, what did you think about when you were putting together that game and thinking about how the pricing structure of that would, would sort of fit? So, 
Uh, it's sort of a puzzle-based game. It doesn't. It's not really conducive to um, any sort of free-to-play monetization. I don't think. Mm-hmm. And you weren't thinking about maybe uh, holding back some of the the content on on sort of timers or anything like that. That wasn't something that you were interested in doing. No. I, uh, no. I think. I mean. Bit counterproductive because it's it's kind of um, you're not really having a good time if you and things like that. So it's, it doesn't it doesn't feel like good design. And um, w- why do you think we have sort of moved away from that? When in the early days, most of the sort of app store games that we would have been playing uh, were exactly that. They were based on timers, and they were encouraging you to come back with notifications. It's hard to say. I don't. Um, I don't really have a lot of experience with those kind of games. I haven't really played many of them. Um, there's. All, I think there's always been done that on the App Store. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I think like things like Crossy Road kind of changed that a bit. Where they made it. I think part of the philosophy there was, you know, you make it to play and then that's the main game um, so people are entertained um, and then you might from people who are you know going to watch the ads or whatever um, yeah I think it's it's definitely very it's, I, it's not really my perception that mm. it's that it's changed I mean every now and then I hear about some game that's got you know timers and whatever like didn't um didn't that racing game real racing have times in or was it am i mistaken yeah i think there has been a number of um i can't remember the exact one that you're talking about there specifically but it's one of the things that i do see with the kind of criticism of this type of gameplay is that you're actually kind of holding people back from actually enjoying the experience and that by sort of interrupting them with these waiting and the timers you're actually not people stop and they go do something else and they might go play a different game yeah. where they can get to the action immediately. Yeah, and eventually... Yeah, I mean, it has been quite successful, though. I think it's like... I mean, you know, if you say they're making a million dollars a day or whatever, then... <laughs> yeah. But yeah. that's... I mean, obviously, a lot of that is to do with just the fact that it's Harry Potter, right? So Yes, that's right. Absolutely, and I think that's yeah. a part of the problem. I wonder what the demographics of that... The people who are actually paying money for that are. I mean, and this are is... they just young kids that have not played something like that before? Mm. And, you know, and... That's that's true. For, don't know any money to unlock this thing. Mm. And, yeah. So, what I think is interesting um, is that obviously the person from Destructoid is probably going to be in a you know maybe in a slightly different uh, demographic, exactly as you mentioned there, and maybe that sort yeah, of game is not the one that's yeah. going to be appealed for them, and that's not what the people are looking for. But maybe that is exactly what some people are looking for for that experience. The article that um, uh, Vadim Bulatov wrote on Game Sutra. Really looking for for time is <laughs> yes. I mean, yeah. Um, he but some saying, people will will pay for any amount of time just to get that slight advantage because, you know, time is the premium that you are, you know, you might have resources to do it. And I think that was part of the motivation between these older style of things, but it seems we've kind of moved away from from that sort of perspective. So Vadim Bulatov, who wrote that Game of Sutra article, says that the problem is that when you do run out of energy during the most dangerous parts of the uh, adventures, the timing is kind of planned and you have to kind of leave your player in a dangerous situation. So adults who are somewhat more jaded to the harsh realities will put the smartphone on their pocket, but children on the other hand are much more sensitive to this, so they will be, be out there and going to do that. That's a really good point, I think. Now, yeah, Jim- I was looking at an article that had a bunch of top 10 tips for like monetizing your mobile games and actually brought up that point is, you know, ultimately the financial success of any free-to-play game is intrinsically linked with how engaged it keeps your players and positioning of, of when you include prompts to pay more money. And that's a very good point. Like to a lot of younger audiences, they would see that and go, oh, I want to buy some money. I want to put some coins into this game because I don't want my player to get my, my car- avatar to get hurt or, or something. But a lot of older people might just go, oh, I'll just wait it out. So it's, you know, if they're, they're going for the target audience is maybe younger players because Harry Potter was always a series that had a lot of young young people or young adults kind of involved in it, people that are going to be more emotionally susceptible to that kind of instant gratification, whereas us older folks maybe just kind of be like, oh, well, you know, I don't want to waste my money on this, so I'll wait it out. Mm-hmm. It kind of really like hones in on that particular kind of targeted marketing. I think maybe potentially, you know, people that, that maybe have a bit of money in their account or that they bug their parents enough, they might be able to kind of, you know, keep pumping dollars into mm-hmm 
that in those situations. So I think that's very interesting that although it puts a lot of stuff behind paywalls, from what I've seen, it, it chooses where to put the paywalls very carefully all the same. Yeah. I, wonder how, I wonder how a lot of those typical situations, like, I mean, if a young kid is not going to have a credit card. Oh, so absolutely, yeah. Like, uh, you know, to their parent, uh, I need to, I need $5 to, like, save Harry Potter. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here you go. Didn't you ask five dollars <laughs> to save Harry Potter like thirty minutes ago? Yeah, <laughs> I, I find that. I mean, as a, as a kid growing up, uh, I had a lot of friends that would um quote unquote um borrow their parents' credit cards uh, a lot. So yes, I do, I do want to. I would be interested to know how many of these people are unaware that their kid has got access to maybe like a PayPal account or some kind of a credit account, or was just given a gift card with a bunch of money for Google Play, or I don't know how it works, you know, and just kind of like the, you know, I want to see like the difference between people that maybe you know have willingly given their kid money for this just to get them to shut up and just to enjoy the game, or people that are unaware that their kid is basically siphoning money out of their account into a mobile game, $5 by $5, you know? Um, I think it's very important to really, you know, it's not the developers here, I don't think, making these Absolutely. type of games or not wanting to make these kind of games anyway. You know, it is the commercially invested parties and it, with Hogwarts uh, and Harry Potter, behind the scenes, uh, the big commercial arm is Warner Brothers. Um, they've just gone through two different development um, studios to do it. Yeah. And uh, I think that's why we resulted in a poor game. But, like, to be honest, my problem with mobile games is the whole prepaid concept. The game's free but riddled with ads and microtransactions, so it's going to be a shit game, like, with that, unless you put money into it constantly. That's how it's designed. Mm. Um, so, you know, that... I think it's interesting as well. So Jen McLean, who's the director at the IGDA, uh, said that people should stop blaming the development team for games that shouldn't be released. You're blaming the exactly the wrong people. If you pick a game that you found disappointing in the last, say, 30 years, say, bad monetization, buggy, frustrating, just not fun, I'll bet money that the dev team said, please don't release this. Game devs are smart and they care about their work and they want to make a great game and they play games too. But in the large majority of cases, the dev team doesn't get to decide the release schedule. They don't get to decide monetization. They may not even decide staffing levels of product strategy. Often devs will try really hard to make an impossible release day and they do this far too often at the expense of their health and wing being, but they do it because they want to make something amazing and wonderful that'll prompt strong emotions, uh, emotions and make your life better. So She's a star, isn't she? What, uh, I think the that's on the head. a perfect way to sort of describe it. And uh, yeah, I think this is an interesting game. Obviously, something is working for it. Maybe some people would look at this game and say, look, this isn't, isn't for me or I, I'm against this type of game. Um, but, but on the flip side, it's, it's working for super, him. super popular. So, like, um, I mean, Harry Anson, Potter is an extremely, it's, yeah. it's an ex extremely lucrative exactly. um, franchise to dig into, especially in the mobile gaming scene, because despite the people that look at this product and go, well, this is garbage for these yeah. reasons, the monetization, you're going to have so many people that go, I don't care, it's Harry Potter, as they're just throwing money at it, you know, because I've seen Harry Potter fans, they are so passionate, they I'm are so into it that, sometimes, you know. I love Harry Potter. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, but, you know, there's always going to be, like, an overlap between people that go, look, I don't want to waste my money on a mobile game, and people that go, I love this, so I'm going to give my money to it, and they just mm. kind of don't think about it as they're going. Because the thing with, like, such small transactions is you don't kind of think about it, and it just adds up, and adds up, and adds up, and adds up, and suddenly you realize you spent $50 on a mobile game, and it's like, oh, I, you know, all, all these little microtransactions just kept happening, you know? Macrotransactions. And <laughs> micro to macro transactions from <laughs> zero to 100 real fast but yeah with 100 clicks i think the real benefit is, is there's plenty of great games out there that you can play that's uh, sometimes it. that have a one-time purchase like potentially dissembler yeah going uh, down the right path there. by our guest uh, ian mcclarty who's joins us now let's uh jump into a quick promo and then we'll be right back with our chat with ian yeah segue mitch what's discord Discord is an online chat service that most gamers use. Incidentally, you can also use it to talk to us at pixelsiv.com.au forward slash Discord. Yeah, you can talk about uh, episodes, you can talk about upcoming topics, you can probably even coerce Mitch into playing a game with you online. That's not going to happen. That is going to happen. You're doing it. I'm saying that's happening. Sorry. Yeah, well... Why Join you, Discord. You should grow your beard back. pixelsiv.com.au forward slash Discord. That swipe is so random. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> now, Ian McClarty is uh, the developer of the game Dissembler. It's described as a subtle puzzle game about unraveling bold abstract designs one colour at a time, with, and it has a fantastic uh, soundtrack and uh, sound effects in it. Very satisfying. Now, Ian, if people haven't had a chance to check it out, how would you describe uh, Dissembler, <clears throat> and, and what sort of game is it? Um, it's, uh, um, I, I couldn't have a lot of trouble um, describing what it is because it... Um, game and it sounds a lot like a, a 
and it is kind of a match three game, but I kind of think of it as more of a, a thinky match three mm-hmm. um, or a match three where you, you know all the information up front. Um, so it's much more like solving a chess puzzle or something like that. Um, about um, experimenting and kind of like seeing how things interact with each other and um, works as you, um, you're flipping pairs of these colored tiles and um, flip per turn. And then at the end of each turn, all the tiles that have um, three or more matching of the same color here, and then they'll stay disappeared. I know. can't flip with an empty spot. So that kind of creates a lot of interesting um, situations where match things in the right order to sort of take it apart in the right way. Um, so why did you yeah. decide to kind <laughs> so, of go in that direction? And uh, why, what was it about this sort of design and, and that you kind of push forward and, and make a game for, for mobile? And it, but it is also available on, on um, desktops as well. Yeah. Yeah, um, so thinking about um, match threes and kind of thinking, they kind of, a lot of the time, they're very random um, feeling. Um, and you're kind of always just looking for the, the next match and then you do it and then some random tiles fall from the top. And I was kind of wondering what something that um, would feel like. So... Um, something where you kind of ahead what was coming um, so you could plan for it. Um, and that got me thinking about how could how could you actually represent what colours are going to replace the colour that you've matched. Um, and so that's what kind of led to the infinite mode of the game, which is you've got the, the tiles are sort of inside each other. And so you can see the next three colors that are coming up. So you can um, planning ahead and kind of um, this leads to, I kind of, I feel like a more kind of satisfying kind of game. Um, now the levels themselves. Yeah. So that was the initial question. Mm. And then the, so that, that was the initial sort of design impetus. And then and I, I quite enjoyed it, but I found when I was play testing with people that, um, overwhelming to look at because it's very colorful and there's a lot going on um on the screen and so i thought i would make a a tutorial to um um the kind of concepts and kind of some some sort of tricks that you can pick up um gradually and that kind of just ended up being its own thing so um i found in actually making the little tutorial levels that they were actually really interesting little puzzles on their own. So I kind of made that the main focus of the game. So I guess that's the kind of the story of how it happened. Um, now, the game itself, like each level that's in there, how, what does it take to kind of put together one of those those levels? And, and you know, how do you compare it to, I guess, the more algorithmically generated uh, match stories that you might, might see out there? I actually have... Uh, uh, there is a daily mode where, where the puzzles are are generated. Um, I found like um, to have a procedural generator, even though sometimes it will generate things that are a bit easy or too hard, because you'll get these permutations of puzzles that you you wouldn't have thought of on your own and kind of it leads to, oh, actually that's like an interesting interaction or interesting little concept that has been generated. Maybe I can design a puzzle around that, um, you know, maybe simplify it a bit, remove some extraneous bits. Um, so just doing about two a day, two or three a day. Uh, well, I normally do sort of maybe about, <clears throat> then it would take me a couple of days to sort of refine them. Built my own editor. So the, the way I built them, I actually built them backwards, if that makes sense. So I would start with a solution, add tiles and flip them so that it, 
I knew it was always solvable. Yeah, cool. That makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, it sounds like, really simple when you put it that yeah, way. Yeah, when obviously. you put it that way, it's like, ah, oh, yeah, of so, course, that's so how you do it. Of course, yeah. you do it. Um, when you're playing Dissembler, it has a very tactile, mechanical feel, especially for a uh, mobile game. Uh, how did you achieve this? Um, so, because I, I wanted um, really good to interact with, um, particularly because go back and you're going to be sort of interacting with the same thing um for a while if you particularly if you get stuck mm. um so i wanted it to still feel right so um and experimentation was kind of a big part of it as well i wanted people to you know touch it and experiment with it so um so the the way i did the sound effects i wanted it to kind of feel like a sort of mechanical thing that yeah, like a mechanical switch when you're flipping the yeah. colors. Yeah, that's what it's like. Clicking sounds are actually from... Um, I went to Bunnings um, and I just <laughs> looked around for the, thing, the clickiest thing I could find uh, or the one that sort of had the nicest sounding clicks. So, there, you know, I would like try like different locks and um, put some of them on my phone. Um, but I found that the best clicky noise was from a... You know, one of those um, adapters you put on a, on a hose to water the garden, and you have all the different modes mm-hmm. like spray, you know, those little garden hose adapters. Yeah. Yes. Those, when you turn the little things to change the mode, that kind of had a really nice clicky sound. Wow. So that's what all the clicks come from is recording that. And then I did a fair bit of processing, but that's what the basis for all the clicks is. So you stepped into many roles in this game, then um, sound designer and coder. And so director. the music, I should say, the music as well was done by someone else. So that was mm. done by Michael Berto. I think he did a really amazing job, kind of like just sort of really pairing it back and kind of yeah, that can feel like different, but also just not getting in the way and kind of feeling contemplative. And, yeah. Bouncing off of that, like talking about how you actually went to Bunnings and sought out the device that made the best clicking noise to kind of use that audio. Mitch has told us that when he's been playing the game, he gets quite a strong ASMR sort of reaction from it. Have you found that other players have had similar feedback about the game or is, is Mitch just a weirdo? <laughs> what's, a, what's ASMR? Uh, it's it's kind of like, you know, you get kind of like a calming, soothing reaction from, from a sound or an interactive experience. Kind of a shiver Autonomous down sensory your, meridian response. Kind of yeah. a shiver yeah, down there your you spine. Go. When, I, yeah, um, I have had that feedback, yeah. So I think there was an article recently in Pocket Gamer that, where that um, the author was talking about that. So, mm. um, yeah, so it has been a thing, definitely. I think the music has probably got a bit to do with that. But also, I think they mentioned that um, the fact that it doesn't, going on are they just sort of like you just go from one puzzle to the next it's not trying to obviously it's not trying to do any sort of monetization stuff it's not trying to even offer you hints and i I found that i really liked their perspective because they said that the hints was like for hints um and i I guess the main reason i didn't put it in was a bit of laziness because it's quite quite hard to do and kind of hard to make it put it in without making it feel kind of patronizing (laughs) so um but the author of this article, um, her name off the top of my head, but um, she said, um, it's kind of, um, sorry, I've lost my train of thought. That's um, okay. I mean, the, the, the ASMR, as we just mentioned, is pretty linked to like um, all that auditory, I guess, synesthesia. Um, yeah. And, and uh, I think your your game really does kind of fill that perfectly, not only with this, with this soft but really well done yeah, yeah, music so, and so sounds, but also like, the colours as well. So what her point was, uh, to get back to that, was yeah, that sure. it sort of trust it, the game. She felt that the game trusted her to to get the answer. Yeah, okay. Like a part of it is just like there's no – the hints can be a bit judgy. It's like, oh, you're not getting this. Are you stupid or whatever? You know, <laughs> it's like kind of like it's a bit judgy in a way. Yeah, you're so, going to fail at a puzzle game. Yeah, relaxing because there's no judgment. It's just like it's just there. It's just a thing. It's not really. It's just a thing, right? It's, it, that's like it's like, it's like when you buy an actual physical puzzle. Mm. This guy called Mister Puzzle on YouTube. I don't know if you've heard of him. But you're right. You get I mean, that satisfaction that just like a usual puzzle, but you at the same time you are doing it via a sit back technology, um, which is very nice. 
Was that kind of a gameplay element important when you were constructing this and trying to differentiate your your puzzle game in in the sea of other puzzle games, especially on mobile, like making it a very relaxing and more calming and non-judgmental experience? I don't think I was doing that necessarily to differentiate it. I think there's a lot of games that claim to be like calming and that. Right, Um, yeah. But I did want it to feel, I, I, I was getting, watching a lot of this um, YouTuber called Mr. Puzzle, and he reviews actual physical puzzles. Um, and so they're like little wooden sort of puzzles or different types of puzzles. And I kind of really like the idea of like a physical puzzle because it's, um, it's a thing and it can't, it can't do anything to kind of help you. You know, it's just is what it is. Um, and there's something in, sort of inherently relaxing about just using your hands to kind of like um, interact with something. So I think that was more motivation than necessarily trying to differentiate it from other puzzle games. But I definitely didn't want it to feel relaxing in the same way that a lot of other games like try to feel relaxing. Like all of them will have this sort of ambient kind of music that kind of like, you know, sort of that wave of like, then I, I don't, I don't necessarily find that it's they're relaxing. They're trying to <laughs> make you. They're trying too hard to make you relax. Exactly. It yeah. feels like it's trying too hard. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So it's kind of like relaxing by just pairing it back and just like reducing everything, just making it. And I will say that's one thing about your game. It does. It does come across very understated, um, but it is quite fantastic and and in, in depth, especially well, you know, it's essentially for a mobile puzzle game. Um, which is in stark contrast to a lot of the other, because I mean, it, it, personally, puzzle games are the one type of mobile game that I tend to enjoy by default because it's a nice like, oh, little brain, you know, yeah. jolt. Uh, and, yeah. But your one, yeah, it was. It was very relaxing. It would be a nice thing to do on the train or something mm. when you were just commuting. Ian, we've got a question from from Limbot, and he's asked whether or not you have ever made anything in the sort of physical puzzle making space, mm. uh, or do, are you only going to make digital games? Is that something you've explored? Um, I haven't explored it. Um, I don't know if I will. Um, why kind of not, said I'm making, why is that? Um, why, why wouldn't you? <laughs> it sounds like you could actually make I guess it. It just sounds like a lot of work, I suppose. Yeah. It's like, or, or, yeah, fair enough. And also, I mean, I've got to consider, like, you know, what would the return be on that? And, like, I don't yeah. know. It's much hard probably, to, harder to distribute yeah, think, physical goods, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Now you I think that could work. But you've, it's a lot of work right you've got to do all the laser cutting and all that stuff and yeah no guess, no doubt yeah. undoubtedly now in you've made uh yeah. to your admission over 30 games of the last five years oh. um it seems like a lot that, that seems like that, a lot of games you're making it, that um, is a lot what sort of games, Small games. <laughs> are you yeah what sort of, what what sort of games do you make and when do you kind of call a point on something and and, and what sort of things sort of inspire you to make a new game um so uh really s- small free games um they they're all inspired by different things um uh um one um recent well actually it was 2016 um but it's been quite well in terms of solaris which are made in about a, a week or so um and that was just really exploring a kind of a, a graphical kind of sort of and just basically taking this graphical trick and then making just something really simple out of it. Um, on, um, on the, after, have you played Doom before? Yes. Yeah, I've also, like we've actually I've played, also played a bit of Catacombs of Solaris. We did. We played it at the, um, no arcade oh, at, yeah, we're yeah. using the, the foot, uh, the floor mat, the dance, controller, dance. a dead DDR type mat. Yeah. Um, I played that game for way too long, I must admit. Um, <laughs> but awesome. Like, and, and when you were talking about that, that, that sensory and colors and, and again, going to that ASMR thing, um, you know, without uh, the, the, the similarities between synesthesia type um, elements and your game seem to be a bit of a recurring theme here. <laughs> the idea of like exploring different ways to make things that sort of... Um, players or kind of get gratification from a game like uh, in, uh, instead of a score like yeah sort of creating visuals i don't know I, I think one of the main reasons i still do enjoy playing games is just to see new things 
So, you know, the reason I want to get to a new level is to see all the new sprites in that in that level. Or you know, with modern 3D games, kind of, I'm more interested in kind of just seeing the new environments. Um, and okay. I guess, like, to me, it's like, so like, you know, sort of exploring that idea. Like Catacombs is also about sort of exploring that idea of like, generated by you as well but it's sort of it's exploring this visual space yeah absolutely it's pretty out there and you do There's something you, gratifying you, about for sure just just seeing a different color like different combination of colors just feels like and also the um, really nice, right? kind of like <laughs> the you haven't completely done away with you know uh logical physics but it does. It's definitely um, a sidestep from what you would think. Um, and if for anyone out there that hasn't seen it, um, do a Google search for Catacombs of Solaris because it is a uh, it's a visual treat. And I think of it as, as well as as you said, we have these sort of experiences with moving through these hallways and things like Doom and, and Wolfenstein and all yeah. these sort of games. And it really does sort of twist that on its head, and it feels like you're kind of walking through a kaleidoscope the whole way through, and you're like, am I walking the right direction? Am I not? But then all of a sudden you're like, oh, no, no, I know where I'm at. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it's quite an interesting experience. Um, but you don't. You don't no, know. You just like, <laughs> so enjoy, and then you go. You're lost in the pixels. Yeah. And you get someone else to give it a, give it a go. And yep. Yeah, but I think that's it. It's sort of these experiential sort of games. Is that sort of something that you do try to aim for, that have that sort of more of an experience and something that people can kind of talk about rather than being... You know, we're going to make sure we have 10 levels with, yeah. you know, X power-ups and monetize this and Five that. Five bosses. Yep. I'm interested in um, the experience of playing games. Um, it doesn't mean that I'm not interested in, like, um, more traditional kind of game play elements, but I'm I'm, I'm having an interesting experience, um, you, you know, whether that uses more traditional elements. Like, I mean, I've created sort of, I guess more traditional action games as well, um, and puzzle games, obviously. But um, kind of like part of the same spectrum. You're sort of creating an experience, and there's kind of like it's keeping the the player interested in it, and and kind of like wanting to explore it more. So it's something something that has some sort of depth to it that compels you to explore it more. I guess it's kind of like interested in if that makes sense mm -hmm. now that dissembler is out and, and people can go and enjoy it what are you working on at the moment or are you taking a bit of a break and, and what sort of games can we look forward to from you in the future so i'm i just finished um a game which is going to be shown at um free play mm -hmm. at the party coming up at the end of the month in the month, yeah. Yep. So, are you going to be at free play? Oh, I wish <laughs> we, we are located on exactly okay. the opposite coast to to that one, so it's always a bit hard. I will, to... I will be attending hopefully most of free play, and now I have another incentive to go check out the party too, if I can manage yeah. to make it to that. So, hopefully, I'll be I'll be at least you know the pixels of representative of free play. Finish that. So that's a kind of a, a sort of a tribute slash um, riff of a game that I really like called uh, Video Ball. Mm -hmm. Action button. Um, uh, Tim Rogers' uh, company. Um, oh. Can you hear me? Those digital yes. lines. Just dropping out. Yeah. Um, so, can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. So you've okay. it's a it's a spin on action. Uh, what is it? Right, video ball um, by Action Button. Have you heard of Video Ball? Yes, I have actually played it on the on the PlayStation. It's quite a quite a fun good party game. Yeah, yeah. So I was kind of just like a riff on that. Mm -hmm. That I, um, did. Um, so I'm feeling pretty good about it. Um, so I'm excited to show that. And then I'm working on an action game. I made a game recently for a, a little jam called Selvage Jam, which is where you take a project that you've kind of abandoned and then you, you just polish it up and then release it like for free, right? So uh, I'm, I released a game called Jump Grid. Um, I kind of, I just sort of put some more visuals on it. Um, it was a game that I kind of abandoned and I'm kind of feeling a lot better about it, like having got some good feedback and like just 
just refreshing the way it feels kind of like just made me more excited about it. So I think I'm going to make that into a, um, a more sort of fleshed out game for a puzzle game. So yeah, I've got a few things going on. And there's plenty of stuff. If you want to go check out some of Ian's uh, other work, uh, if you're interested, you can go to Ian McClarty dot itch dot io um, and you can pick up uh, catacombs of solara so you can pick up dissembler uh, which will give you a pc and also on android as well it's on the uh, apple app store as well ian thank you very much for joining us um it's always a i guess a real f- pleasure to to discover the games that we had played and thought were really amazing and, and meet the people that make them so thank you very much for for making the time to speak to us today mm. Now, we will be sticking links up to everything up on our website, and that website is pixelsift.com.au. Uh, this episode of the podcast was produced by Michelo, Fiona, Bartholomeus, and I'm the executive producer, hosting by Scott and Sarah. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can support Pixelsift by visiting the Pixelsift store. That's pixelsift.com.au forward slash store, and pick yourself up a sweet T-shirt, a tote bag, or more. And if you enter the promo code SIFTERS, you get 25% off your order. That's pixelsift.com.au forward slash store promo code sifters scott we're on social media yes you can find us on social media where you get alerts when we go live we love your questions and if you've got the chance to ask the developers we speak to questions each week when we're live we're at facebook.com forward slash pixel sift twitter.com forward slash pixel sift twitch.tv forward slash pixel sift and youtube.com dot uh, youtube.com forward slash pixel sift au and sarah if people want to go listen to our older Very episodes um, where should they head to you can go to our website to stream all your older episodes, all your favourite episodes, all the episodes. You can subscribe as a podcast either on iTunes, Pocket Cast, or using the RSS link on our page. We're live every Thursday and next week uh, at the same time. Join us for Pixels of Plays as we check out some of the indie games we feature on the podcast and more. And our next proper full podcast episode will be on the 24th of May. And jump on our Twitch channel because Mitch will be streaming uh, Fortnite tomorrow night and a bunch of other times, so Friday night fortnights. Fighting at Fortnite. I'm going to shave this damn beard before next week. (laughs) Thanks, Ian. Thank you.